Hey everyone, we're back for another reading of Small Gods. Hopefully we'll be able to get about halfway to the end. We'll see. That's quite a few pages, but it'll be fine. Let us keep going. <clears throat> Vorbis stirred the ashes with his foot. No bones, he said. The soldier stood silently. The fluffy gray flakes collapsed and blew a little way in the dawn breeze. And the wrong sort of ash, said Vorbis. The sergeant opened his mouth to say something. Be assured, I know that of which I speak, said Vorbis. He wandered over to the charred trap door and prodded it with his toe. We followed the, we followed the tunnel, said the sergeant, in the tones of one who hopes, against experience, that sounding helpful will avert the wrath to come. It comes out near the docks. Um... But if you enter it from the docks, it does not come out here, Vorbis mused. The smoking ashes seemed to hold an endless fascination for him. The sergeant's brow wrinkled. Understand, said Vorbis. The Ephebians wouldn't build a way out that was a way in. The minds that devised the labyrinth would not work like that. There would be valves, sequences of trigger stones, perhaps. Trips that trip only one way. Wearing blades that come out of unexpected walls. Ah, most intricate and devious, I have no doubt. The sergeant ran a dry tongue over his lips. He could not read Vorbis like a book, because there had never been a book like Vorbis. But Vorbis had a certain habits of thought when, that you learned after a while. You wish for me to take the squad and follow it up from the docks, he said hollowly. I was just about to suggest it, said Vorbis. Yes, Lord. Vorbis patted the sergeant on the soldier on the <laughs> shoulder. But do not worry, he said cheerfully. Alm will protect the strong in faith. Yes, Lord. And the last man can bring me a full report. But first, they are not in the city? Uh, we have searched it fully, Lord. And no one left by the gate? Then they left by sea. All the Ephebian war vessels are accounted for, Lord Vorbis. The, this bay is lousy with small boats. Uh, with nowhere to go but the open sea, sir. Vorbis looked out to the Circle Sea. It filled the world from horizon to horizon. Beyond lay the smudge of the stow plains and the ragged line of the ram tops, all the way to the towering peaks that the heretics called the Hub, but was, which was, he knew, the Pole, Visible around the curve of the world only because the way light bent in the atmosphere, just as it did in water. And he saw a smudge of white curling over the distant ocean. Vorbis had very good eyesight from a height. He picked up a handful of gray ash, which had once been Dakari's principles of navigation, and let it drift through his fingers. Olms has sent us a fair wind, he said. Let us get down to the docks. Hope waved optimistically in the waters of the sergeant's despair. Uh, you won't be wanting us to explore the tunnel, Lord, he said. Oh, no. You can do that when we return. Orn prodded at the copper globe with a piece of wire while the unnamed boat wallowed in the waves. Can't you beat it? said Simony, who was not up to speed with the difference between machines and people. Uh, it's a philosophical engine, said Ern. Beating won't help. But you said machines could be our slaves, said Simony. Not the beating sort, said Ern. The nozzles are bungled up with salt. When water rushes out of the globe, it leaves the salt behind. W why? I don't know. Water likes to travel light. We're becalmed. Can't we do anything about it? Yes, wait for it to cool down and clean it out and put some more water in it. Simony looked around distractedly. But we're still in sight of the coast. You might be, said Didactylos. He was sitting in the middle of the boat with his hands crossed on the top of his walking stick, looking like an old man who doesn't get often get taken out for an airing and is quite enjoying it. Don't worry, no one could see us out here, said Ern. He prodded at the mechanism. Anyway, I'm a bit worried about the screw. It was invented to move water along, not move along on water. Uh, you mean it's confused, said Simony? Eh, screwed up, said Didactylos happily. Brutha lay in the pointed end, looking down under the, at the surface. A small squid siphoned past, just under the surface. He wondered what it was. 
and knew it was a common bottle squid of the class Cephalopoda phyla mollusca that had an internal cartilaginous support instead of a skeleton and well-developed nervous system and large, image-forming eyes that were quite similar to vertebrae eyes. The knowledge hung in the forefront of his mind for a moment and then faded away. Uh, um? Rutha whispered. What? What are you doing? Trying to get some sleep. Tortoises need a lot of sleep, you know. Simony and Ern were bent over the philosophical engine. Rutha stared at the globe, a sphere of radius R, which therefore had a volume of V equals four thirds times pi RRR, and surface area A equals four times pi, pi RR. Oh my god. What now? said the voice of the tortoise. The dactylos's face tor turned towards Brutha, who was clutching at his head. Uh, what's a pie? The dactylos reached out and a hand and steadied Brutha. Uh, what's the matter? said Ohm. I don't know. I. It's just words. I don't know what's in the books. I can't read. Uh, getting plenty of sleep is vital, said Ohm. It builds a healthy shell. Brutha sagged to his knees under in the rocking boat. It felt like a householder coming back unexpectedly and finding the old place full of strangers. They were in every room, not menacing, but just filling the space with their thereness. The books are leaking. I don't see how that can happen, said Didactylos. You said you just looked at them. You didn't read them. You don't know what they mean. They know what they mean. Listen, they're just books. The nature of books. No, of the, yeah, of the nature of books said to Dactylos, they're not magical. If you could know what books contain just by looking at them, Ern there would be a genius. Oh, what's the matter with him, said Simony. He thinks he knows too much. No, I don't know anything. Not really no, said Brutha. I just remembered that squids have an internal cartilaginous support. I can see that would be a worry, said Simony. Huh, priests, mad the lot of them. No! I don't know what cartilaginous means. Uh, skeletal connective tissue, said Didactylos. Think of uh, bony and leathery at the same time. Simon he snorted. Well, well, he said. We live and learn, just like you said. Some of us even do it the other way around, said Didactylos. Is that supposed to mean something? It's philosophy, said Didactylos. And sit down, boy, you're making the boat rock. We're overloaded as it is. It's being buoyed Upward by the force equal to the weight of the displaced fluid, muttered Brutha, sagging. Hmm? Except, I don't know what boy means. Ern looked there from the sphere. We're ready to start again, he said. Just bail some water in here with your helmet, mister. And then we shall go again? Well, we can start getting up steam, said Ern. He wiped his hands on his toga. You know, said Didactylos, there are different ways of learning things. I'm reminded of the time when old Prince Lasgear of sort asked me how he could become learned, especially since he hadn't got any time for this reading business. And I said to him, there's no royal road to learning, sire. And he said to me, bloody well build one or I shall have your legs chopped off. Use as many slaves as you like. A refreshingly direct approach, I always thought. Not a man to mince words. People, yes, but not words. Why didn't he chop your legs off, said Ern? I built him his road, more or less. How? I thought that was just a metaphor. You're learning, Ern. So I found a dozen slaves who could read, and they sat in his bedroom at night, whispering choice passages to him while he slept. Uh, did that work? Don't know. The third slave stuck a six-inch dagger in his ear. Then after the revolution, the new ruler let me out of prison and said I could leave the country if I promised not to think of anything on the way to the border. But I don't believe there was anything wrong with the idea in principle. Ern blew on the fire. Eh, it, it takes a little while to heat up the water, he explained. Rutha lay back in the bow again. If he concentrated, he could stop the knowledge flowing. The thing to do is avoid looking at things. Even a cloud, devised by natural philosophy as a means of occasion, occasioning shade on the surface of the world, thus preventing overheating, caused an intrusion. Alm was flat, fast asleep. Knowing without learning, thought Brutha. No, the other way around. Learning without knowing. Nine-tenths of Alm dozed in his shell. The rest of him drifted like a fog in the real world of the gods, which is a lot less interesting than the three-dimensional world inhabited by most of humanity. He thought, we're a little boat. He'll probably not even notice us. Then there's the whole of the ocean. She can't be everywhere. Of course, she's got many believers, but we're only a little boat. 
He felt the mind of inquisitive fishes nosing around the end of the screw, which was odd, because in their normal courses of things, fishes were not known for their... Greetings, said the Queen of the Sea. Ah, I see you're still managing to exist, little tortoise. Ah, uh, hanging in there, said Om. No problems. There was a pause which, if it were taking place between two people in the human world, would have been spent in coughing and looking embarrassed. But gods are never embarrassed. I expect, said Om guardedly, you are looking for your price. This vessel and everyone in it, said the queen. But your believer can be saved, as is the custom. What good are they to you? One of them's an atheist. Huh. They all believe right at the end. That doesn't seem... Om um, hesitated. Uh, fair? Now the Sea Queen paused. What's fair? Like, underlying justice, said Om. Um. He wondered why he said it. Sounds a human idea to me. They're inventive, I'll grant you. But what I meant was, I mean, they've done nothing to deserve it. <laughs> deserve? They're human. What's deserve got to do with it? Om um had to concede to this. He wasn't thinking like a god. This bothered him. It's just... You've been relying on one human for too long, little god. I know, I know, Om um sighed. Minds leaked into one another. He was seeing too much from a human point of view. Take the boat, then, if you must. I just wish it was... There, said the Sea Queen. She moved forward. Om um felt her all around him. There's no such thing, she said. Life's a beach, and then you die. And then she was gone. Alm um let himself retreat into the shell of his shell. Brutha, yes. Can you swim? The globe started to spin. Brutha heard Ern say, There, soon be on our way. We'd better be. Now, this was Simony. There's a ship out there. This thing goes faster than anything with sails or oars. Brutha looked across the bay. A sleek Omnium ship was passing the lighthouse. It was still a long way off, but Brutha stared at it with a dread and expectation that magnified better than telescopes. It's uh, moving fast, said Simony. I don't understand it. There's no wind. Ern looked round at the flat calm. There can't be wind there and not here, he said. I said, can you swim? The voice of the tortoise was insistent in Brutha's head. I don't know, said Brutha. You think you could find out quickly? Ern looked upwards. Oh, he said. Clouds had massed over the unnamed boat. They were visibly spinning. You've got to know, shouted Ohm. I thought you had a perfect memory. We used to splash around in the big cistern in the village, whispered Brutha. I don't know if that counts. Mist whipped off the surface of the sea. Brutha's ears popped, and still the Omnian ship came on, flying across the waves. What do you call it when you've got dead calm surrounded by winds, Ern began. A hurricane? said Didactylos. Lightning crackled between the sky and the sea. Ern yanked the lever that lowered the screw into the water. His eyes glowed almost as brightly as the lightning. Now there's power, he said, harnessing the lightning, the dream of mankind. The unnamed boat surged forward. Is it? It's not my dream, said Didactylos. I always dream of a giant carrot chasing me uh, through a field of lobsters. I mean a metaphorical dream, master, said Ern. Oh, what's a metaphor, said Simony. Brutha said, what's a dream? A pillar of lightning laced the mist. Secondary lightning sparked off the spinning globe. Eh, you can get it from cats, said Ern, lost in philosophical world as the boat left a white wake behind him. You stroke them with a rod of amber and you get tiny lightnings. If I could magnify that a million times, no man would ever be a slave again and we could catch it in jars and do away with the night. Lightning struck a few yards away. Uh, we're in a boat with a large copper ball in the middle of a body of, a, of salt water, said Didactylos. Thanks, Ern. And the temples of the gods would be magnificently lit. Uh, of course, said Ern quickly. Didactylos tapped his stick on the hull. It's a nice idea, but you'd never get enough cats, he said. The sea surged up. Jump into the water, Om shouted. Why, said Brutha. A wave almost overturned the boat. Rain hissed on the surface of the sphere, sent up a scalding spray. I haven't got time to explain. Jump overboard. It's for the best. Trust me. Brutha stood up, holding the sphere's, fa sphere's framework to steady himself. 
Sit down, said Ern. I'm just going out, said Brutha. I may be some time. The boat rocked under him as he half jumped, half fell into the boiling sea. Lightning struck the sphere. As Brutha bobbed to the surface, he saw for a moment the globe glowing white hot and the unnamed boat, its screw almost out of the water, skimming away through the mist like a comet. It vanished in the clouds and rain. A moment later, above the noise of the storm, there was a muffled boom. Brutha raised his hand. Ohm broke the surface, blowing seawater out of his nostrils. You said it would for the, be for the best, screamed Brutha. Well, we're still alive, and hold me out of the water. Tortoises can't swim, but they might be dead. Do you want to join them? A wave submerged Brutha. For a moment, the world was a dark green curtain, ringing in his ears. I can't swim with one hand, he shouted as he broke the surface. Then we'll be saved. She wouldn't dare. What do you mean? Another wave slapped at Brutha and suction dragged at his robes. Um, um, yes, I don't think I can swim. Gods are not very introspective. It has never been a survival trait. The ability to cajole, threaten, and terrify has always worked well enough. When you can flatten entire cities at a whim, tendency toward quiet reflection and seeing things from the other fellow's point of view is seldom necessary. Which had led, across the multiverse, to men and women of tremendous brilliance and empathy devoting their lives to the service of deities who couldn't beat them at a quiet game of dominoes. For example, Sister Cecina of Quirm defied the wrath of a local king and walked unharmed across a bed of coals and propounded a philosophy of sensible ethics on behalf of a goddess whose only real interest was in hairstyles. And Brother Zephylite of Clatch left his vast estates and his family and spent his life ministering to the sick and poor on behalf of the invisible god Ferum, generally considered unable. Should he have the backside to find it with both hands? Should he have hands? Gods never need to be very bright when there are humans around them to be it for them. The Sea Queen was considered fairly dumb even by other gods, but there was a certain logic to her thoughts as she moved deep below the storm-tossed waves. The little boat had been a tempting target, but here was a bigger one, full of people sailing right into the storm. This one was fair game. The Sea Queen had attention span of an onion bahi, and by and large she created her own sacrifices, and she believes in quantity. The fin, got, the fin of God plunged from wave crest to wave trow, gale tearing at its sails. Captain fought his way through the waist-high water to the prow, where Vorbis stood clutching the rail, apparently oblivious to the fact that the ship was wallowing half-submerged. Sir, we must reef sail! We can't outrun this! Green fire crackled at the top of the mast. Vorbis turned. The light was reflected in the pit of his eyes. It is all for the glory of Orm, he said. Frost is our sail, and glory is our destination. The captain had had enough. He was unsteady on the subject of religion, but he felt fairly confident that after 30 years, he knew something about the sea. The ocean floor is our destination, he shouted. Vorbis shrugged. I did not say there would not be stops along the way, he said. The captain stared at him and fought his way back across the heaving deck. What he knew about the sea was that storms like that, this didn't just happen. You didn't just sail from calm water into the midst of a raging hurricane. This wasn't the sea. This was personal. Lightning struck the mainmast. There was a scream from the darkness uh, as a massive torn sail and rigging crashed onto the deck. The captain half swam, half climbed up the ladder to the wheel, where the helmsman was a shadow in the spray and it, the eerie storm glow. We'll never make it out alive. Correct. We'll have to abandon the ship. No, we will take it all with us. It's a nice ship. The captain peered closer into the murk. Is that you, Bozen Copley? Would you like another guess? The hull hit like a submerged rock. Or the hull hit a submerged rock and ripped open. Lightning struck the remaining mast like a paper boat that had been too long in the water, and the fin of God folded up. Balks of timber splintered and fountained into the whirling sky. And then, and there was suddenly, and there was a sudden, Velvety silence. Captain found um, that he had quite a recent memory. 
It involved water and a ringing in his ears and the sensation of cold fire in his lungs, but it was fading. He walked over to the rail, his footsteps loud in the quietness, and looked over the side. Despite the fact that the recent memory included something about the ship being totally smashed, now it seemed to be whole again. In a way. Uh, he said, we appear to have run out of sea. Yes. And land, too. The captain tapped the rail. It was grayish and slightly transparent. Uh, is this wood? Morphic memory. Sorry? You were a sailor. You have heard a ship referred to as a living thing. Oh, yes, you can't spend a night on a ship without feeling that it has a soul. Yes. The memory of the fin of God sailed on through the silence. There was the distant sighing of wind, or of memory of wind, the blown-out corpses of dead gales. Uh, the, the ghost of the captain. Did you just say, were? Yes. I thought you did. The captain stared down. The crew was assembling on deck, looking up at him with anxious eyes. He looked down further. In front of the crew, the ship's rats had assembled. There was a tiny robed shape in front of them. It said, Squeak. He thought, hmm, Even rats have a death. Death stood aside and beckoned to the captain. You have the wheel. But, but where are we going? Who knows? The captain gripped the spokes helplessly. But there are no stars that I recognize, no charts. What are the winds here? Where are the currents? Death shrugged. The captain turned the wheel aimlessly. The ship glided on through the ghost of a sea. Then he brightened up. The worst had already happened. It was an amazing how good it felt to know that. And if the worst had already happened, where's Vorbis? He growled. He survived. Did he? There's no justice. There's just me. Death vanished. The captain turned to wheel, the wheel for a bit and for the look of the thing. After all, he was still the captain and this was still, in a way, a ship. Uh, Mr. Mate, uh, the mate saluted. Sir, um, where shall we go now? The mate scratched his head. Well, Captain, I did hear a heathen clutch I got this paradise where there's drinking and singing and young women with bells on and, you know, regardless. The mate looked hopefully at his captain. Regardless, as they said the captain thoughtfully. Mm, so I did hear. The captain felt that he might be due some regardless. Any idea how you get there? I think you get given the instructions when you're alive, said the mate. Oh, and there's some barbarians up towards the hub, said the big mate, relishing the word. Who reckon that they go to a big hall where there's all sorts to eat and drink. And women, bound to be. Captain frowned. It's a funny thing, he said. But why is it that the heathens and the barbarians seem to have the best places to go when they die? A bit of a poser, that, agreed the mate. I suppose it makes up for them enjoying themselves all the time when they're alive, too. He looked puzzled. Now that he was dead, the whole thing sounded suspicious. I suppose you've got no idea to get to that paradise, either, said the captain. Sorry, captain. No harm in searching, though. The captain looked over the side. If you sailed for long enough, you were bound to strike shore. No harm in searching. A movement caught his eye. He smiled. Good. A sign. Maybe it was for the best after all. Accompanied by ghosts, by the ghosts of dolphins, the ghost of a ship sailed on. Seagulls never ventured this far along the desert coast. Their niche was filled by the Scalby, a member of the Crow family, that the Crow family would be the first to disown and never talked about in company. It seldom flew, but walked everywhere in a sort of lurching hop. Its distinctive call put listeners in a mind of malfunctioning digestive system. It looked like other birds looked after an oil slick. Nothing ate scalbies, except other scalbies. Scalbies ate things that made a vulture sick. Scalbies would eat vulture sick. Scalbies ate everything. One of them, on this bright new morning, sidled across the flea-hopping sand, pecking aimlessly at things in case pebbles and bits of wood had become edible overnight. In the Scalby's experience, practically anything became edible if it was left for long enough. It came across a mound lying on the tide line and gave it a tentative jab with its beak. The mound groaned. The Scalpy backed away hurriedly and turned its attention to a small domed rock beside the mound. It was pretty certain it hadn't been there yesterday either. It essayed an exploratory peck. 
The rock extruded it ahead and said, Bugger off, you evil sod. The scabby leapt backward and then made a kind of running jump, which was the nearest any scabby ever bothered to come to actual flight to a pile of sun-bleached driftwood. Things were looking up. If this rock was alive, then eventually it would be dead. The great god Ohm staggered over to Brutha and butted him with his head with his shell until he groaned. Ah, wake up, lad. Rise and shine. Hup, hup, hup. All ashore. Who's going ashore? Brutha opened an eye. What happened, he said. You're alive is what happened, said Ohm. Life's a beach, he remembered, and then you die. Brutha pulled himself into a kneeling position. There are beaches that cry out for bright, brightly colored umbrellas. There are beaches that speak of majesty of the sea. But this beach wasn't like that. It was merely a barren hem where the land met the ocean. Driftwood piled up on the high tide line, scoured by the wind. The air buzzed with unpleasant small insects. There was a smell that suggested that something had rotted away a long time ago, somewhere where the scalbies couldn't find it. It was not a good beach. Oh, God. Better than drowning, said Alm encouragingly. I wouldn't know, Ruth. Brutha looked along the beach. Is there any water to drink? Nah, I shouldn't think so, said Alm. Uh, Osiri 5 verse 3 says you make a made living water flow from a dry desert, said Brutha. That was uh, by way of being our, our... Oh yeah, that was by way of being artistic license, said Alm. You can't even do that? No. Brutha looked at the desert again. Behind the driftwood lines and a few patches of grass that appeared to be drying even while it grew, the dunes marched away. Uh, which way to Omnia, he said. We don't want to go to Omnia, said Om. Brutha stared at the tortoise. Then he picked him up. I think it's this way, he said. Om's legs waggled frantically. What do you want to go to Omnia for, he said. I don't want to, said Brutha. I'm going anyway. The sun hung high above the beach. Or possibly it didn't? Brutha knew things about the sun now. They were leaking into his head. The Ephebians had been very interested in astronomy. Apletius had proved that the disc was 10,000 miles long. Febrius, who'd stationed slaves with quick reactions and carried voices all across the country at dawn, had proved that light traveled at about the same speed as sound. And Didactylos had reasoned that, in that case, in order to pass between the elephants, the sun had to travel at least 35,000 miles in its orbit every day, or, to put it another way, twice as fast as its own light. Which meant that mostly you could only ever see where the sun had been, except twice a day, when it caught up with itself. And this meant that the whole sun was faster than light particle or tachyon, or as Didactylos put it, a bugger. It was still hot. The lifeless sea seemed to steam. Ruther trudged along, directly above the only piece of shadow for hundreds of miles. Even Ohm had stopped complaining. It was too hot. Here and there, fragments of wood rolled into the scum at the edge of the sea. Ahead of Brutha, the air shimmered over the sand. In the middle of it was a dark blob. He regarded it dispassionately when he approached, capable of any real thought. It was nothing more than a reference point in a world of orange heat, expanding and contracting in the vibrating haze. Closer to it turned out to be Vorbis. The thought took a long time to seep through Brutha's mind. Vorbis. Not with a robe, all torn off, just his singlet with the nails sewn in. Blood all over one leg, torn by rocks. Vorbis. Vorbis. Brutha slumped to his knees. On the high tide line, a scalby gave a croak. He's still alive, Brutha managed. Pity, said Om. We should do something for him. Yes, maybe you can find a rock and stove his head in, said Om. Yeah, just leave him here. Watch us. No. Brutha got uh, his hand under the deacon and tried to lift him. To his dull surprise, Vorbis weighed almost nothing. The deacon's robe had concealed a body that was just skin stretched over bone. Brutha could have broken him with his bare hands. What about me, whined Om. Brutha slung Vorbis over his shoulder. You've got four legs, he said. I am your god! Yes, I know. Brutha trudged along the beach. What are you going to do with him? Take him to Omnia, said Brutha thickly. People must know what he did. You're mad! You're mad! You think you're going to carry him to Omnia? Don't know. Gonna try. You! 
you! Um pounded a claw into the sound. Millions of people in the world, and it had to be you! Stupid, stupid. Ritha was becoming a wavering shape in the haze. That's it, shouted Um. I don't need you. You think I need you? Nah, I don't need you. I can soon find another believer. No problem about that. Rutha disappeared. Then I'm not chasing you, Alm screamed. Rutha watched his feet dragging one in front of the other. He was past the point of thinking now. What drifted through his frying brain were disjointed images and fragments of memory. Dreams. They were pictures in your head. Uh, Coaxis had written a whole scroll about them. The superstitious thought they were messages sent by God, but really they were created by the brain itself, thrown up as it nightly sorted and filed experiences of the day. Ruth had never dreamed, so sometimes, blackout, while the mind did the filing, it filed all the books, now he knew without learning. That was dreams. God. God needed people. Belief was the food of the gods, but they also needed a shape. Gods became what people believe they ought to be, so the goddess of wisdom carried a penguin. It could have happened to any god. Should have been an owl, everyone knew that, but one bad sculptor had only ever known, or only ever had an owl described to him, makes a mess of a statue, belief steps in. The next thing you know, the goddess of wisdom is lumbered with a bird that wears the evening dress the whole time and smells of fish. You give a god its shape, like jelly fills a mold. Gods often become your father, said Abraxas, the agnostic. Gods became a big beard in the sky, because when you were three years old, that was your father. Of course, Abraxas survived. Uh, this thought arrived sharp and cold out of the part of his my own mind that Brutha could still call his own. Gods didn't mind atheists, if they were deep, hot, fiery atheists like Simony, who spent their whole life not believing spend their whole lives hating gods for not existing. That sort of atheism was a rock. It was nearly belief. Sand. What you found in deserts, crystals of rocks sculpted into dunes. Gordo of sorts said sand was worn down mountains, but Rexes had found that sandstone was stone pressed out of sand, which suggested the grains were the fathers of mountains. Everyone a little crystal, and all of them getting bigger. Much bigger. Quietly, without realizing it, Brutha stopped falling forward and lay still. Bugger off! The scalby took no notice. This was interesting. It, had, it was getting to see a whole new stretches of sand it had never seen before. And, of course, there was the prospect, even the certainty, of a good meal at the end of it all. It had perched on Ulm's shell. Ulm stumped along in the sand, pausing occasionally to shout at the passenger. Brutha had come this way. But there... Here was, but here one of the outcrops of rock, littering the deserts like islands in a sea, stretched right down to the water's edge. He'd never been able to climb it. The footprints in the sand turned inland, towards the deep desert. Idiot! Um struggled up the side of the dune, digging his feet in to stop himself from slaloming backwards. On the far end of the dune tracks became a long groove, where Brutha must have fallen. Um retracted his legs and tobogganed down it. The tracks veered here. He must have thought that he could walk around the next dune and find the rock again on the other side. Om knew about deserts, and one of the things he knew was that this kind of logical thinking had been previously applied by a thousand bleached, lost skeletons. Nevertheless, he plodded after the tracks, grateful for the brief shade of the dune, now that the sun was sinking. Around the dune, and yes, here they zigzagged awkwardly up a slope about 90 degrees away from where they should be heading, guaranteed. That was the thing about deserts. They had their own gravity. They sucked you into the center. Ruther crawled forward. Vorbis held unsteadily by one limp arm. He didn't dare stop. His grandmother would hit him again. There was Master Numrod, too, drifting in and out of vision. I am really disappointed in you, Ruther. Hmm? Water. Water. Water, said Numrod. Trust in the great god. Ruther concentrated. Numrod vanished. Great god, he said. Somewhere there was shade. The desert couldn't go on forever. The sun set fast. For a while, Ohm knew the heat would radiate off the sand and his own shell would store it. That would soon go, and then there would be the bitterness of desert night. Stars were already coming on when he found Brutha. Vorbis had been dropped a little way away. 
Um pulled himself level with Brutha's ear. Hey! There was no sound and no movement. Um butted Brutha gently in the head and looked at the cracked lips. There was a pecking noise behind him. The scalby was investigating Brutha's toes, but its explorations were interrupted when a tortoise jaw closed around its foot. I told you! Ugger off! The scalby gave a burp of panic and tried to fly away, but was hindered by a determined tortoise hanging on to one leg. Almost bounced along the sand for a few feet before he let go. He tried to spit, but tortoise mouths aren't designed for the job. I hate all birds, he said to the evening air. The scalby watched him reproachfully from the top of the dune. It ruffled its handful of greasy feathers with the air of one who was prepared to wait all night, if necessary, as long as it took. Alm crawled back to Brutha. There was still breathing going on. Water. The god gave it some thought. Smiting the living rock. That was one way. Getting water to flow? No problem. It's just a matter of molecules and vectors. Water had a tendency to flow. You just have to see it to it that it flowed here instead of there. No problem at all to a god in peak condition. How do you tackle it from a tortoise perspective? The tortoise dragged himself to the bottom of the dune and then walked up for or walked up and down for a few minutes. Finally, he selected a spot and began digging. This wasn't right. It had been fiery hot. Now he was freezing. Rutha opened his eyes. Desert stars, brilliant white, looked back at him. His tongue seemed to fill his mouth. Now what was it? Water. He rolled over. There had been voices in his head, and now there were voices outside his head. They were faint, but they were definitely there, echoing quietly over the moonlit sands. Rutha crawled, crawled painfully towards the foot of the dune. There was a mound there. In fact, there were several mounds. The muffled voice was coming from one of them. He pulled himself closer. There was a hole in the mound. Somewhere far underground, someone was swearing. The words were unclear as they echoed back and forward up the tunnel, but the general effect was unmistakable. Rutha flopped down and watched. After a few minutes, there was a movement at the mouth of the hole and Ohm emerged, covered with what, if this wasn't a desert, Brutha would have called mud. Oh, it's you, said tor the tortoise. Tear up a bit of your robe and pass it over. Dreamlike, Brutha obeyed. Turn around down here, said Ohm, is no picnic, let me tell you. He took the rag in his jaws, backed around carefully and disappeared down a hole. After a couple of minutes, he was back, still dragging a rag. It was soaked. Rutha let the liquid dribble into his mouth. It tasted of mud and sand and cheap brown dye and slightly of tortoise, but he would have drunk a gallon of it. He could have swum in a pool of it. He tore off another strip for Alm to take down. When Alm reemerged, Rutha was kneeling next to Vorbis. Sixteen feet down! Sixteen bloody feet! shouted Alm. Don't waste it on him! Isn't he dead yet? He's got a fever. Put him out of his misery! Still taking him back to Omnia. You think we'll get there? No food? No water? But you found water. Water in a desert. Nothing miraculous about that, said Om. There's rainy season near the coast. Flash floods. Waters. Dried up riverbeds. You get uh, aquifers, he added. Sounds like miracles to me, croaked Brutha. Just because you can explain it doesn't mean it's not a miracle. Oh, that was... Well, there's no food down there. Take it from me, said Om. Nothing to eat. Nothing in the sea. If we can find the sea again. I know the desert. Rocky ridges you have to go around. Everything turning you out of your path. Dunes move that move in the night. Lions. Other things. Gods. What do you want to do then, said Brutha? You said you, you said better alive than dead. You want to go back to a Phoebe? We'll be popular there, you think? Om was silent. Brutha nodded. Fetch more water then. It was better traveling at night with Vorbis over one shoulder and Ohm under one arm. At this time of year, the glow of the sky over there is the Aurora Corealis, the hub lights where the magical field of the Discworld constantly discharges itself among the peaks of Cori Celesti, the central mountains. And at this time of year, the sun rises over the desert in Ephebe and over the sea to Omnia. So keep the hub lights on your left and the sunset glow to your... Did you ever go to Cori Celesti, said Brutha? Ohm, who had been nodding off in the cold, woke up with a start. Huh? It's uh, where the gods live. Ah, I could tell you stories, said Ohm darkly. What? 
They think they're so bloody elite. You didn't live up there then? No, gotta be a thunder god or something. Gotta have a whole parcel of worshippers to live on Knob Hill. Gotta be an anthropomorphic personification, and one of them things. Not just a great god, then. Well, this was the desert, and Brutha was going to die. May as well tell you, muttered Alm. It's not as though we're going to survive. See, every god's a great god to someone. I never wanted to be that great. A handful of tribes, a city or two, it's not that much to ask, is it? There's two million people in the Empire, said Brutha. Yeah, pretty good, eh? Started off with nothing but a shepherd hearing voices in the head, ended up with two million people. But you never did anything with them, said Brutha. Like, what? Well, tell them not to kill one another, that sort of thing. I uh, never really given it much thought. Why should I tell them that? Brutha sought for something that would appeal to the god's psychology. Well, if people didn't kill one another, there'd be more people to believe in you, suggested. Hmm. It's a point, Om um, conceded. Interesting point. Sneaky. Rutha walked along in silence. There was a glimmer of frost on the dunes. Uh, have you ever heard, he said, of uh, ethics? Somewhere in uh, Hawandaland, er, Hawand isn't it? The Phoebeans were very interested in it. Probably thinking about invading. They seem to think about it a lot. A uh, long-term strategy, perhaps. I don't think it's a place, though. It's more to do with how people live. What, lolling around all day while slaves do the real work? Take it from me. Whenever you see a bunch of buggers puttering around talking about the truth and beauty and the best way of attacking ethics, you can bet your sandals is because dozens of other poor buggers are doing all the real work around the place while those fellers are living like... Gods? said Brutha. There was a terrible silence. I was gonna say kings, said Om reproachfully. They sound a bit like gods. Kings, said Alm emphatically. Why do people need gods? Brutha persisted. Oh, you've got to have gods, said Alm in a hearty no-nonsense voice. But it's gods that need people, said Brutha, to do the believing, you said. Alm hesitated. Well, okay, he said. But people have got to believe in something, yes? I mean, why else does it thunder? Thunder, said Brutha, his glaze, eyes glazing slightly. I don't. It's caused by clouds banging together. After the lightning stroke, there's a hole in the air, and thus the sound is engendered by the clouds rushing to fill the hole and colliding in accordance with strict cumulodynamics principles. Your voice goes funny when you're quoting, said Om. What does engendered mean? I don't know. No one showed me a dictionary. Hmm. Anyway, that's just an explanation, said Om. It's not a reason. My grandmother said thunder was caused by the great god Om taking his sandals off, said Brutha. She was in a funny mood that day, nearly smiled. Metaphorically accurate, said Om, but I never did thundering. Hmm, demarcation, see? Hmm, bloody, I've got big hammer blind Io up in Knob Hill does all the thundering. I thought you were, you said there were hundreds of thunder gods. Yeah, and he's all of them. Rationalization. A couple of tribes join up, they got, both got thunder gods, right? And the gods kind of run together, you know how uh, amoebas split? Uh, no. Well, it's like that. Uh, only the other way. Um, well, I still don't see how one god can be a hundred thunder gods. They all look different. Ah, uh, false noses. What? And different voices. I happen to know Io's got 70 different hammers. Not common knowledge, that. And it's just the same with the mother goddesses. There's only one of them. She's got a lot of wigs, and of course, it's amazing what you can do with a padded bra. There was absolute silence in the desert. The stars, smeared slightly by high-altitude moisture, were tiny, motionless rosettes. Away towards the church, called the Top Pole, and which Brutha was coming to think of as the hub, the sky flickered. Brutha put Ohm down and laid Vorbis on the sand. Absolute silence. Nothing for miles except what he had brought with him. This must have been how the prophets felt when they found, or when they went into the desert to find whatever it was they found and talked to, whoever they talked to. He heard Om, slightly peevish, say, People have got to believe in something. Might as well be gods. What else is there? Rutha laughed. You know, he said, I don't believe, I don't think I believe in anything anymore. Nah, except me. No, I know you exist, said Rutha. He felt Om relax a little. There's something about tortoises. Tortoises I can believe in. 
seem to have a lot of existence in one place. It's the gods in general I'm having difficulty with. Look, if people stop believing in gods, they'll believe in anything, said Om. They'll believe in young Ern's steam ball. Anything at all. Hmm. A green glow in the sky indicated that the light of dawn was chasing frantically after its sun. Vorbis groaned. Don't know why he won't wake up, said Brutha. Can't find any broken bones. How do you know? Uh, one of the Ephemian scrolls was all about bones. Can't you do anything for him? Why? You're a god. Well, yes, if I was strong enough, I could probably strike him with lightning. I thought Io did the lightning. No, 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 just the thunder. You're allowed to do as much lightning as you like, but you got a contract for the thundering. Now the horizon was a broad golden band. How about rain, said Brutha? How about something useful? A line of silver approached the bottom of the gold. Sunlight was racing towards Brutha. That was a very hurtful remark, said the tortoise. A remark calculated to wound. In the rapidly growing light, Brutha saw one of the rock islands a little way off. Its sand-blasted pillars offered nothing but shade. Or, but shade, always available in large quantities here in the depths of the citadel, was now in short supply here. Caves, said Brutha. Snakes. But still caves. In conjunction with snakes. Poisonous snakes? Mm, yes. And I think that's where we will leave off. For today we're getting very very close to the end thank you once again everybody for being here for another reading of terry pratchett's small gods i estimate we should be able to finish it and probably four more readings or so until next time thank you so much for being here and i will see you then